X5. On this episode of Exploration Outer Space. There's a big difference between spending six months in space and spending a year in space. Recently, there have been some impressive breakthroughs that have changed our perception of outer space. Such as a new way of detecting explosive events in our universe. We're just starting to scratch the surface. It's a monumental achievement. And a new method of sending astronauts to the space station. We're back to launching crew from the United States. Lift off. Join us as we look at some profound game changers Whoa. in space exploration. About a hundred years ago, Albert Einstein theorized that something called gravitational waves could stretch and squeeze the literal fabric of space-time. It's a lot to take in. Well, in the 90s, scientists set out to prove this idea with the greatest scientific undertaking the National Science Foundation had ever funded. And a couple decades later, they succeeded. I'm here in Louisiana to check out one of the observatories that proved Einstein right and opened up an entirely new way to study the universe. A gravitational wave is a distortion of space, and space is a structure. In that structure, if you have some collision, then you will get ripples on that fabric, like ripples on a pond. If gravitational waves can be detected, they will help explain the formation of galaxies and the universe itself. In an effort to build a super sensitive detection device, in 1984, a joint effort between Caltech and MIT begins to design LIGO, which stands for Laser Interferometer Gravitational Wave Observatory. This project is funded by the National Science Foundation. Two identical observatories are built, one in Louisiana and one in Washington. Each observatory has two L-shaped arms that are two and a half miles long. Inside these arms, a laser beam of light is generated and directed toward a beam splitter, which splits it into two distinct and equal beams. The light beams travel to a distant mirror. The mirror reflects the light back to the beam splitter, repeating this process over and over. Now you've set it up so that the wavelength of light is basically telling you that the two arms have the same length. Then a gravitational wave comes. And so if you imagine that coming down on the L of the interferometer, it will make one arm shorter and one arm longer. Our instrument has to be so precise that from here to the sun, you would have to determine that distance to the size of an atom. So that's kind of difficult to do without a very good laser, very good mirrors, very long arms, and very, very little interference from ground motion. When LIGO first becomes operational in 2002, Almost nine years pass, and not a single detection. So, they spend another five years upgrading the detectors. As a result, LIGO becomes three times more sensitive than before. On September 10th, 2015, almost immediately after upgrades in the detectors are completed, a strong signal arrives. It was very loud, and we're like, can it really happen that you just build the machine and you turn it on and boom? The signal just seemed too beautiful, so we spent a lot, a lot of time vetting that signal, and honestly, I didn't believe it. Does the LIGO Observatory in Hanford, Washington, receive the same signal 2,000 miles away? It turns out that they also receive the exact same signal. This confirms that they indeed detected a gravitational wave. From the nature of the signal, it is determined that the cause of this was the merging of two black holes. 
A black hole is a massive object that's been created by the collapse of a massive star. That generated this set of ripples about a billion years ago, actually. And those ripples then traveled across the universe to our detectors here, which had just come online. Anna Maria takes me to the part of LIGO which detected the moment the lasers fall out of sync due to gravitational waves. Okay, so we've seen the rest of the instrument, the laser goes into the detector, travels down, comes back, and then finally it gets here where we have the photodiodes that see the gravitational waves. So this is where the detections happen. Yes. I feel like I'm in the presence of royalty. <laughs> Coming up, another cataclysmic event is discovered by LIGO, giving us more clues about our universe. A key to LIGO's detection system are the lasers that beam inside the two arms. They exist in an ultra vacuum, so their light is as pure as possible. I'm with Scott McCormick, who's in charge of this vacuum operation. And we're in this tube of concrete, I'm assuming. What is the purpose right. of that? So the concrete tube is here to protect the vacuum system from the elements. Okay. Rain, bad weather. And this tunnel is dehumidified. So we try to keep things clean as we can and dry. Uh, so which is hard because we're in Louisiana. Right. <laughs> That's probably our biggest challenge is keeping this dry and clean. When the announcement of the gravitational wave detection happened, I was just absolutely blown away, like the rest of the world. And I don't know that I'd imagine that I'd be this close to where all that magic happened. I mean, the laser is just right in here. Can I touch this? Sure. Whoa. <laughs> That's pretty cool. After the first historic gravitational waves are recorded, Several more gravitational waves are detected before the year is out. Since then, we've published 11 events, 10 of which were black hole events like this, and we've announced about 40 events. Because now when we see a signal in our data, we send an announcement to the astronomical community so the telescopes can look in the sky and see if they see any associated signal. Besides black holes, LIGO Observatory detects another kind of phenomenon, the merging of two neutron stars. A neutron star is the core of an exploded massive star. It's so dense that just a teaspoon of a neutron star material has the mass of a billion tons. This event occurred 130 million light years away and, thanks to LIGO, was able to be observed by many telescopes. Thanks to this incredible achievement in engineering, LIGO has opened up an entirely new way to study the universe. We're just starting to scratch the surface. We're continuing to upgrade our detectors. Eventually, we hope to be able to see gravitational waves from very, very early in the universe, from the first fractions of a second after the Big Bang. And so, LIGO is actually a first step towards understanding the origins of the universe. It was a hundred years ago when Einstein proposed the concept of gravitational waves. If he were around today, I think he'd be pretty pleased to see how his work has contributed to understanding the most fundamental questions of our existence. Coming up, we'll meet with Scott Kelly, the astronaut who spent nearly a year in space. I think it's groundbreaking, and it allowed NASA to figure out how to do genetic-based research in space. Space exploration change the human body. For years, we've studied astronauts during their time in space, but it's hard to know what would have happened if that same person had just stayed down here on Earth. It's not every day you have a genetic copy to compare their experience to. That all changed with this next man we're about to meet. 
He and his identical twin brother were a game changer. Scott Kelly is a veteran of four space flights, including a 340-day stay on the International Space Station, the longest ever by a NASA astronaut. It was during Scott's final mission that scientific breakthroughs were made. Tell me about the NASA twin study. Where did that come from? What is that all about? Where this originated from was actually, it came from a question that I asked. When I was assigned to this year-long flight, I said, if a reporter asks a question about any kind of study comparing me to my brother, how should I answer that question? And the reason I asked, you know, having someone there for so long was such a unique opportunity, and I felt like maybe somebody would think a study with these two identical twins might have some merit. And lift off. The year in space starts now. Scott and Mark would each perform the same test at the same time. Scott in space, Mark on Earth. What better way to see how space can affect the body? When I was on the space station for a year, there was 400 different science experiments that were going on at one time. One of the experiments measures the telomeres in both Scott's and Mark's bodies. Telomeres are small structures that protect the ends of our chromosomes. They are vital to our health, and they get shorter as we age. The hypothesis, you know, the guess of what was going to happen was, I'm in space, all this radiation, microgravity environment, and my telomeres would get shorter than his, which made sense. But they actually got better. Another surprise finding was what they discovered about Scott's gene expression. When Scott returned after 340 days in space, 7% of his gene expression had changed. Basically, it's what controls who we are, how we live and die. I think it's groundbreaking, and it allowed NASA to figure out how to do genetic-based research in space. This twin study gives NASA some interesting data to work with on how long-term space travel affects humans. But to really get the full picture, studies will need to be done on many more astronauts because the goal is to, one day, bring human settlements to Mars. From my experience spending 340 days in microgravity, we can go to Mars, we can take 200 days to get there, and I think the crew on the Martian surface with one-third the Earth's gravity would probably be able to function fairly well after landing. And then you're living in a gravity field for a long time, maybe a year and a half, 500 days, and then you come back, and then when you get back to Earth, you'll have people helping you. When that day comes, when we finally reach Mars and put boots on the ground, it will be achieved thanks to the contributions of one of NASA's finest astronauts, Scott Kelly. Coming up. It's been a long time since astronauts were launched from U.S. soil. Now, that's all about to change. T-minus 25 seconds. Ever since the space shuttle program ended in 2011, the only way astronauts could get to the International Space Station was on Russia's Soyuz rocket. Now, all these years later, NASA's partnered with Boeing on another spacecraft to bring humans to orbit. Their CST-100 Starliner will launch on a rocket with a very successful history, United Launch Alliance's Atlas V. The Atlas V has a perfect success rate. The Atlas was the rocket that carried John Glenn into orbit way back in the 60s. So this is the latest generation of it, much larger, much more powerful. Cyrus Rex. It's our workhorse. And the lower tank that you see here, this is the RP-1 tank. That's the, the Atlas V rocket is 191 feet tall and 12 and a half feet in diameter. I mean, this is impressive just to stand next to a rocket this size because you can really have a feel for how much fuel, how much propellant you need to leave the Earth. In flight, Atlas burns about 2,800 pounds of fuel per second. Wow. On top of Atlas V will be the Starliner spacecraft. And it's no stretch to call this mission a game changer. When the space
shuttle program came to an end in 2011, NASA would hire two private companies to design and build the next generation spacecraft that will bring astronauts to and from the space station. Those two companies were SpaceX and Boeing. How will Starliner be different than the space shuttle? Big difference is, well, similarity is they both landed on land. The big difference is we do it without wheels. We return under canopy, under parachutes, and right before landing, we inflate airbags. In the past, NASA always had their capsules land in the ocean. Having them descend on land will be a first. The crew inside will experience a jolt when they finally land. How big of a jolt? You can be sure that's been well tested. Three, two, one, release. A lot of testing, a lot of learning. That's what gets you to a good, safe spacecraft. An aspect that's similar to the space shuttle is that the capsule will be reusable. But first things first, Boeing needs to prove to NASA that the Starliner system can deliver. The moment of truth arrives near the end of 2019. T minus 25 seconds. On December 20th, Starliner is about to be launched atop an Atlas V rocket. It will be a flight test without a crew. The mission? To dock with the International Space Station. Coming up, if this mission is successful, Boeing will be one step closer to sending astronauts one, to the space station. And lift off the rise of Starlight. You're watching Exploration Outer Space on Exploration Station. And lift off the rise of Starlight. In December of 2019, Starliner is launched in the early morning at Cape Canaveral. A flight test without a crew, the goal of this mission is to dock with the International Space Station and then return safely back home. Unfortunately, when Starliner reaches the stratosphere, software issues put the spacecraft in the wrong orbit. As a result, the mission is cut short, and the capsule is forced to return without docking with the space station. The good news, the landing portion of the mission is successful. I'm here with Elizabeth Balga, a landing and recovery operations engineer with the Starliner program. Elizabeth, what are we looking at behind us? Yeah, so this is the orbital flight test vehicle. Um, okay. She actually just got back from space a couple of weeks ago. Very cool. And how did the landing portion go of OFT? Well, judging by this beautiful capsule, it yeah. went perfectly. Picture um, perfectly. Definitely. It remains to be seen when the next Starliner launch will take place. Will it be a crewed mission with astronauts on board? If so, Elizabeth is quite familiar with the astronauts who will make this trip. The astronauts who will be flying crewed flight tests, they're always here. We've got Chris Ferguson, who actually works for Boeing, and we've got the other folks that are going to be on board, and you see them in and out, looking at the vehicle, learning more about it, talking to our employees constantly to make sure that they know everything they can. So They're they double-checking their work. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, looking over our shoulder. Yeah. Being able to send astronauts to the space station from United States soil is the ultimate goal. It may take another test flight or two, but when they ultimately succeed, it will be a game changer, like the others we've seen in this episode. Thanks for joining us today on Exploration Outer Space. Whoa. We'll see you next time. That's pretty cool.